late today, but we're still here. It's wonderful. Uh, quick update this week. We have tomorrow, Monday, NAMI at 5.30. Christian Ed is on 6.30 on Zoom. Yes. 6.30 on Zoom. Uh, this Tuesday, even though it's the third Tuesday, uh, we are doing the drive-up distribution at Lernerville, and I believe that's because on the 26th, when it would have been, there must be something going on at Lernerville. So they had to do that the third. The walk-in will be next Tuesday. But so if you're leaving for the um, distribution this week, if you can make it, it's 945 from the church. Uh, bells are at 530 on Wednesday. Praise team, worship team rehearsals at 6, 630 and 715 choir. And Saturday day and Sunday we'll be busy with the pumpkin fest. We don't have anything else to do. So I think there are sign-up sheets back there. Uh, next week we will not be worshiping here. We will be worshiping with everybody down at the fire hall. So uh, 10 o'clock down there. That's all I have. Kathy, do you want to talk about the rummage sale? The good news is uh, the rummage sale of 2023 is over. Yay! It's amazing what we do in one week. Um, everything was put out. We opened the doors on Thursday to about 18 people waiting to come in about 20 months before we even opened doors. So our advertising is working. Believe me, we've asked. Facebook is a wonderful place. They all said they woke up and they said they must have their coffee and look at Facebook. Oh, the church is having a rummage sale. I've got to get there. And the signs in the front, we had a couple, many people telling us how they noticed those. So I think that's a good thing for us to keep going. Um, the people are extremely generous in this community. That's all I can tell you. Uh, last year we made $2,200 this year so far, and we have monies I still think coming will trickle in $2,110. So that's a good thing. And I hate to say it, but please start your box again. <laughs> Good, because in 364 days, guess what? We're back again, but it's a great fundraiser. It couldn't go on without the community, our church community. I thank everybody, because everybody had something to do with what we, what we brought in. It's one of those types of fundraisers. So get your box ready. We'll see you next year. Thank you. Thank you to Kathy and Steve for steering that ship. And maybe when you came in upstairs, you saw some garbage bags and things. Those are favors. So if you have room in your garbage can, that would be wonderful. I said we did put a couple down here, but that, that consider that. Amy, do you want to talk about trunk or treat or anything like that? Do you have anything? Uh, we, in September, we're starting to think about 2024. Uh, we have two members of our consistory that will be, uh, it's their last year. We'll be, uh, Kurt and Cindy will be leaving two big shoes to fill there. So if you're interested in serving St. John's, just let me know. That would be great. And uh, any other announcements? So which one is this? Then I'm going to leave with this. Never forget the three powerful the resources you always have available to you. Love, prayer, and forgiveness. Let us prepare our hearts for worship.
Peace of God be with you. I invite you to share your sign of God's peace. I invite you to stand and join with me, and you are my king.
going to come over here first. And we're going to open the door for a new key. We have the key of identity, being accountable, and you can open the door. And we have the key of forgiveness. Yeah, so let's see where we can put that on.
Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you, thank you for forgiving me. Help me, help me to forgive others. To forgive others. Thanks, guys. I want you to now stand and join with me in our, in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Jesus, you teach us to forgive. Ask how many times we need to forgive others. You fill us with grace, and yet we don't share that grace with others. Jesus, please open our hearts to you. Amen. Jesus forgives us and shows us understanding and love. As we receive forgiveness and love, we hear Jesus' words to offer forgiveness and love to others. Amen. You may be seated. God, we listen to the sounds around us things we feel around us and within us. We come with all that we are and who we are. We thank you for your love and for your acceptance, for the joy that we experience of having you as part of our lives. Thank you, God, for being on our faith journey with us, helping us to grow spiritually and to draw closer to you. For Jesus and all of his teachings, for his healing, for all that he did. We ask for healing for each one that we have mentioned this day. We pray for all of those with long-term illnesses, for those who are nearing end of life and on hospice. We lift them up and their families that are on this journey with them, give them the strength they need. We pray for all with cancer and as they're during their treatments and we celebrate those who are at end of treatments and those who've heard ner ner news that their cancer is back we just lift them up for healing and strength we pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones as we look around even in the world we continue to see disasters not just our, our country and others and the loss of life in the morning for those who are who experience other natural disasters of the flooding and the hurricanes and the bad weather the tornadoes and just picking up their lives oh god no we know it's so hard again we ask for strength and thank you for the agencies that are there to help them through this and communities the communities of love that reach out we thank you for our community here in Evan City and beyond, and for the people, how we may minister to the, the community and how the community ministers to us. We thank you, God, for your love, for the joys of life, of celebrations of birth and anniversaries and milestones in our lives, for new birth and pregnancies. We ask for the women that you keep them safe and we often forget that, that many times pregnancies are difficult and go wrong, so we lift them up to you, God. And for the birthing centers and those that are there to help them. Thank you, God, for your amazing love and all that you are. For Jesus Christ, and we pray now as he's taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
So this is our last Sunday. We're learning and opening the doors and finding the keys to the doors to meaningful life. Keys do open doors. So as we think about keys that help us experience a meaningful life, Jesus pulls out the key of forgiveness. I mean, do we really want to go there again? The disciple Peter did. How many? How many calories should I eat? How many pounds do I need to lose? How many times do I need to eat alone in the cafeteria? How many times do I have to be nice to the kid on my bus who continues to bully me and get on my last nerve? How many ounces are in a pound? How many people are in the world? How many times did your mom say, how many times do I have to tell you? A few. On Mom Life website, Kanisha um, Griffin shared, I heard myself saying, son, how many times do I have to tell you to flush the toilet and wash your hands? How many times do I have to tell you to pick up your toys when you're done playing with them? How many times do I have to tell you to stay in your bed? And then one day my four-year-old yelled, five! <laughs> she said, I really wanted to scream, but all I could do was laugh at his sarcasm. His little toddler mind had a valid point though, she said. He was probably tired of me asking how many times. And rightfully so, since I did something that I say often. And when I do, she said, I'm probably on the edge of a minor breakdown, completely spent, tired, wondering why is this happening and why will he not just get it the first time. I wonder what was going on with Peter's, in Peter's mind when he asked Jesus, how many times? So we're going to read the beginning of Matthew 8. Well, actually, it's the middle. Matthew 18, verse 21, um, the beginning of our scripture for today. Peter came up to the Lord and asked, How many times should I forgive someone who does something wrong to me? Is seven times enough? So some of you are saying, wow, 77 times, really? And then other you, others of you are saying, what, 77 times? I thought it was 70 times 7 times. That's 490 times. Well, there are some translations that say 70 times 7, and other translations that say 77. But does it really matter? And I know some of you are saying, yeah, there's a big difference between 77 times of forgiveness and 490 times of forgiveness. And yes, they are. And I'd say, well, so we're up to, we're down to just keeping track of how many times you forgive that person. You all have your little forgiveness book out ready to chalk down. Okay, I already forgave them 75 times. We're getting real close there. Peter thought that forgiving a person seven times was enough. Well, at least it should be. But Jesus thought otherwise. If we've had a relationship that has lasted even a short while um, or have been around people, the chances are that we've had to forgive or be forgiven. It takes forgiveness to mend broken relationships. When we harbor unforgiving feelings, our hearts become corroded, causing damage to our lives. But there are times that we do find it really, really hard to forgive. Peter must have been finding it hard to forgive. He said, hey, Jesus, suppose somebody in my family does something really bad against me, you know, like sins against me. How many times should I forgive that person? Like seven times? Is that enough? Dr. Derek Weber says, I can't help but think that he expected Jesus to say something like, hold on there, Sparky. Forgiveness is a good thing, but let's not get carried away with it. I, I mean, three is pretty good. Four is like out of the park. Seven? Oh, don't be ridiculous. But that isn't what Jesus said. Jesus did the math. Seventy-seven times. Seventy times seven. It wasn't really about the math. It was and is all about the grace. Jesus wasn't giving us a forgiveness checklist to say, okay, check, got him forgiven. He was talking about infinite grace. Dr. Derek Weber goes on to share that instead of measuring slights against us, we begin living by grace offered to us. 
Instead of counting points of division, we measure out ways that we can come together. After Jesus did the math, he then told a story. And we're going to read that story now, um, continuing on with verse 23. One day a king decided to call in his officials and ask them to give an account of what they owed. But he didn't have any money to pay what he owed. The king ordered him to be sold, along with his wife and children, and all he owned, in order to pay the debt. The official got down on his knees and began begging, Have pity on me, and I will pay you every cent that I owe. The king felt sorry for him, and let him go free. He even told the official that he did not have to pay back the money. But as this official was leaving, he happened to be another official who owed him 100 silver coins. So he grabbed the man by the throat. He started choking him and said, Pay me what you owe. The man got down on his knees and began begging, Have pity on me and I will pay you back. Instead, he went and he had the other official put in jail until he could pay what he owed. Then they told the king what happened. When you begged for mercy, I said you did not have to pay back a cent. The king was so angry that he ordered the official to be tortured until he could pay back everything he owed. Then as I saw my father in heaven, which would treat you, if you could not forgive each of my followers with a ball in your heart. So we read that the official owed 50 million silver coins. I mean, that's just, I mean, who could even think about I I can't even think, actually, a couple hundred silver coins, let alone 50 million silver coins. Other version says the man owed 10,000 talents. In a case, writer um, Winters notes that in that day, a talent was the largest unit of currency. And 10,000 was the largest number in the Greek language. So the servant owned owned the largest amount that was possibly able to he was able to to owe. He could not have had a larger debt. His need to for forgiveness could not have been greater. The story actually kind of shows us some of Jesus's humor um, because he gave such outlandish amounts that he was talking about. when, when it was uh, the amount. So this king wanted to settle this account with his servant. And he calls in this guy. So this 50 million silver coins would have been about 150 years of wages. Yeah. I mean, how could he even accumulate that debt unless he was spending days and days in the casinos, which they didn't have at that time. So it was, this was all really, Jesus was really telling a kind of ridiculous story um, to, get the, uh, to make a point. So the slave says, be patient with me, and I will pay you everything. Well, you know, it would take a lot of patience to wait until someone paid you back what they owed in 150 years. That's a lot of patience, a lot of waiting. Yet the king decided, you know, just to wipe away the debt. It shows the outlandish extent to which God will forgive us. And then there was the man who was this, who had been forgiven this enormous debt, and he he stumbles across a fellow slave who owed him a hundred denarii. That's only a hundred days' wages. Jesus says again, do the math: a hundred days versus a hundred and fifty. No, actually, if you do a hundred fifty years, that's fifty. 4,750,000 4,750,000 days of owing money. 
100 versus 54 million 750 days. So the man is forgiven 54 million 750 days and he won't forgive 100 days. Hmm. So now the first guy is going to jail to be tortured until he can pay his entire debt. Really bad decision. Jesus' grace and forgiveness pays our debts. Jesus invites us to freely share that same forgiveness and grace instead of counting how many times we should forgive someone. The king had a big heart. Unfortunately, the servant did not. Some, we, we all find forgiveness difficult at times in our lives. Sometimes because we can't forgive ourselves for things and other times we find it more difficult to receive than to give. Forgiveness does not only impact the two parties involved. The community is involved. Imagine how the other servants responded to the king when they found out that he had forgiven the other servant's debt. Now the king seems approachable, so they can go to him and say, hey, I have this really big debt and I can't pay it. Could you maybe forgive my debt? And so forgiveness blessed the king, the servant, and the community. Unforgiving, on the other hand, broke trust in the community, ultimately harmed the one who withheld mercy. The point isn't that God will punish us for not forgiving. The scripture said he was tortured, but the torture was of his own making. Sometimes our torture is harboring that anger, that, that harboring that anger and hatred instead of offering forgiveness. It hurts us. It can cause bitterness and brokenness. Forgiveness is a letting go. We release and are released by it. But Jesus didn't ignore human feelings. He joins us in the difficult places of our lives, understanding. Anna Case Winter shared, yes, we have been hurt, and by holding on to our bitterness, allowing the resentments to fester like bacteria, causes sickness in our lives. And Jesus is saying, please, for my sake, let it go. We are released. When we release, we are released. Jesus um, showed us how he connects with our humanity. Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, to forgive is not just to be altruistic, though. It is the best form of self-interest. It is a process that doesn't exclude hatred and anger. That's part of it. These emotions are all part of being human. You should never hate yourself for hating others who do terrible things. The depth of your love is shown by the extent of your anger. However, when I talk of forgiveness, I mean the belief that you can come out of it on the other side as a better person. A better person than the one being consumed by hatred and anger. Remaining in that state locks you in a state of victimhood and makes you almost dependent on your perpetrator. Mark Sowersby, he was the author of a book called Forgiving the Nightmare, shared his story. He was going to seventh grade, looking forward to junior, junior high school. I don't know how many of us look forward to junior high school. I'm not sure that I really was, but maybe. But it, for him, it meant, you know, more independence. You got your own locker, switching classes. Um, he had dyslexia. So due to his dyslexia, they put him in a special ed class. That was, we know, a few years ago, right, when they did that. And um, so they realized at the beginning of seventh grade, they... Um, made an announcement they were going to elect officers. That meant they were going to have a president, a vice president, a secretary of treasurer of their seventh grade class. And Mark thought that was a really big deal, and he was excited about it. He couldn't wait to vote for those, those people. And so they were going to be called class by class to go and vote. So all that day in school, he waited for the vote to get a chance to go vote, and his class was never called. So he went into the vice principal's office and said, I'd just like to know why my class wasn't called in to vote. And he says, Mark, we did not call you because we don't call romper room students to do things like that. His words crushed Mark. He felt belittled and shunned and rejected. It hurt more because 
He never expected it to come from a teacher, a, I mean a vice principal. Later in life, Mark shared, as I walked through the valley of forgiveness I tr and trusted in the word of the Lord and stood on God's promises, I would say, Lord, help me to forgive that vice principal. God gave me the ability to walk in grace and forgiveness through his love and mercy. Charity Ferrieta wrote seven tips for forgiving someone who hurt you. She wrote, getting hurt by others is inevitable. It feels lousy. In fact, that sometimes the bad feeling lasts and lasts and lasts and lasts. Fred Luskin, founder of Stanford University Forgiveness Project, says, to forgive is to let go of the eternal bitterness, resentment, and self-pity over an experience in the past. He said, get mad. That's part of it. Feel hurt. Grieve. Allow yourself to feel all those feelings. And then he says, um, then um, he says, don't worry. You aren't, by feeling those feelings, you aren't saying that that offense was okay. Set boundaries and recognize that you're telling a story that can be changed. You're telling a story that, um, you know, my best friend five years ago didn't invite me to her wedding and I'm really still hurting over it. But maybe you can change those words to say, you know, we were kind of in a rough patch in our relationship then and she was, you know, had all that going on with the wedding. She probably just overlooked it and, um, and, and she did the best she could. He said, make ourselves a hero. He said, we can change our, the story by how we speak of it again. He said, the reason I'm unhappy now is my wife left me three years ago. Um, he said, that's creating a victimhood. Make yourself the hero. A better statement would be, the reason I'm unhappy is that when my wife left me, I didn't have adequate resources for dealing with it, and I still haven't figured out how to make peace with that. It means you're still working on it and it's okay. When one is able to forgive, it leads to strength in handling one's life. Anne Lamott said, I do not understand the mystery of grace, only that it means meets us where we are, but does not leave us where it found us. And that's the power of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, forgive 70 times seven times. May we all come to experience Jesus' grace and forgiveness in our lives. Amen. <clears throat> Whatever you want to do. If any of you like to sing along, you may. But we're not singing the third verse. The musicians are just playing it. So we're going to sing verse 1 and 2, then they're going to play verse 3, and we're going to come back in on verse 4.
invite you now to stand and join with me in our prayer of dedication for our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Jesus, we bring our tithes and offerings to you with joy. We ask your blessings on them. Lead us to use them to carry out your mission of love. Amen. now go forth knowing and experiencing God's love and forgiveness. May we go forth in the joy that we have in Jesus Christ, and may the Holy Spirit lead us onward now and always. Amen. Mm -hmm. 